just going to talk for about 30 seconds and then uh, hand over to Mike. But as Adam mentioned, uh, my name is Scott George. I work for the USGS. Um, I've loved, loved fish my whole life, and that's always been what I, what I wanted to study and how, how I ended up here. Um, I've been working in the Catskills now for approximately six or, or seven years. Fish are what I enjoy studying, um, response to disturbance in particular. Um, I did want to acknowledge um, a number of the agencies that have made a lot of the research possible um, that you know, you'll see today. Uh, obviously the USGS, uh, New York State uh, DEC Region 3, we've worked closely with Mike's team for a number of years now. Uh, the Ashokan Watershed Stream Management Program, uh, New York City DEP, um, and also NYSERDA have all contributed either either funding or, or manpower or, or technical advice. Um, this is my boss, this ugly guy, Barry Baldigo. Uh, he couldn't make it down uh, today, but uh, he's got one heck of a brown trout in his hands here. Um, quick look at the talk outline, and then, then I'll hand off to, to Mike. Um, Mike's going to start uh, by giving you a history of the Esopus fish community, so how we got from, you know, I guess, pure undisturbed brook trout water to where we are today, um, the current management practices uh, that the state is currently uh, using uh, to manage our fisheries resource. Um, we'll talk, uh, then he'll hand off to me actually, and I'll talk about the current status of fish communities. We'll look at some of the research that the USGS has been conducting recently. Um, we'll talk a little bit about anticipated uh, future climate effects, so what some of the latest climate models are showing for our, our region and how we might expect that to affect our fisheries. Uh, and then I'll hand back off to Mike for some uh, concluding thoughts on, on managing for the future. So it's all yours, Mike. Uh, thank you. I I'm so happy to be here to talk about something I really like, which is the Esopus Creek and the fisheries of the Ashokan Reservoir. Um, my, my story is going to begin prehistorically and then come forward to about 2013. And it, really, it's just for the, for the, for the story because um, we've learned a lot since 2013, and Scott's going to really handle that. But I'm going to leave you um, with what our thought process was by 2013. and. Um, let Scott take the next step. My sources go back within our DEC office with fisheries data back to the 1880s when the um, commission, uh, the Forest, Fish, and Game Commission put together annual reports. And it was actually pretty interesting to go back and look at some of those old stocking records, even for private individuals. Um, there's lists of you know, all the fish that went in to the stony clove, for instance, and things like that. So we, you, we go back that far sort of in the printed um, fisheries files. The rest from tw 1920s and 30s, we have a really good sort of systematic set of data that started with an effort to go across the whole state and sample pretty much every single water. And so from the 1930s on, um, on a water by water basis, we have individual files. But to go back further than that, um, you really have to look at the angling literature, newspaper articles, whatnot. A couple books by Ed Van Putt, who was actually a fisheries technician for us for, I think, close to 40 years, if not 40 years. Uh, and he just has done an exhaustive amount of research. It's one of his great loves. And he's truly a, a historian and put together these two books, which uh, you know, sort of really paints the picture that I'm going to talk about here for the, for the first maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, my total por portion here goes about 25, 30. So obviously back at pre-colonial times with the uh, Native Americans being the only real in indigenous people here, um, they were living off the land, obviously. And the, the, this, the landscape was really different than it is today because it was clear cut for the most part throughout the whole uh, Catskills, even though they're forested today, the species were a little differently, different. Um, it was mostly spruce and fir and birch and ash. The lowlands moving up the slopes were hemlock, northern hardwoods, including beech, birch, and maple. Um, and um, uh, you know, you'll notice a lot of the same names, these, these names that are, are so famous now, Willow Weemock, they roll off your tongue. For people who come to our region for the first time, to listen to how they pronounce these, it's pretty funny. But you know, they were uh, the Native American words, really. Never sink, Willow Weemock, Sopas, Mongop. Um, and so it's kind of neat that they're still here today. By the time um, New York City was uh, developed, and uh, really not fully developed, obviously, there were still some fisheries going in the city. And the first uh, regulation in the New World actually for fisheries protection was in New York City in 1734. So if you think about that, it's over 280 years ago. There was a recognition that fisheries weren't sustainable 
at really high levels of fishing pressure or with certain types of gear. And that regulation banned netting and only allowed hook and line. So there was also recognition that there was um, you know, maybe uh, you know, an efficiency uh, method that you could use to regulate people to help regulate a fishery. Um, by 1759, um, and this is, that year is in there just because there was probably a resource that Ed Van Putt found that uh, men and women began to pursue you know, solitude outside the city looking for fishing uh, for you know, recreation or just relaxation. And to probably to get away from what was occurring down in the city and the devastation that probably did happen to some of the fisheries that uh, did exist there naturally. Um, for settlers in the Catskills, well, they were probably living off the land also, and wild meat and game and, uh, uh, and, from, and fish were probably a good port, part of their diet. At that point, it was probably you know, relatively sustainable. Um, but shortly thereafter, I think there were a series of events that occurred that really had an, imp uh, had an impact. By the 1800s, the carriage roads were starting to get developed, um, and there were impro improvements that allowed tourism up in the Catskills and increased fishing pressure. Um, there was also some uh, habitat destruction, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, and then as New York City's population grew even further and the advancements in transportation occurred, there were steam boats that came up the Hudson and dropped people off in Kingston. Carriage roads took them up into the Catskills from there. Um, and then obviously later the railroads. What was, the, the Catskills were really well known early on for sheer numbers of, of small trout, brook trout exclusively, and they were really high numbers. Um, sort of reference to six guys going out and catching 1,300 brook trout in two days of fishing in the 1840s. Gives you some idea as to the, you know, the, how abundant the fishery might have been up there at that time. <clears throat> the trout creels were sold by weight, you know, it's like a 12 pound creel up to a 24 pound creel. If you think about 24 pounds of little, you know, tiny dollar bill size smaller brook trout, you know, you may have 100 plus fish in a, in a creel. Uh, there were big fish, no doubt. Uh, there were reference to White Lake, Echo Lake as being locations where some big brook trout existed. So by the 18 and 18, 1840s and 50s, a combination of overfishing and changes in the forest landscape, the water quality, it all began to have its impact on, on, on the trout fisheries. Um, there were leather tanneries on almost every single uh, trout stream in the Catskills, and they, dis they essentially, you would cut the hemlocks down, strip the bark, use that in the tanning process. That discharge out into the, uh, Creek. All right. That discharge out into the creek was toxic to fish in its own right, um, and the streams were warming up without the hemlock overcover. Um, and then you had, going into the 19th century, a series of continual events with sawmills, deforestation. Um, the sawmills had dams, of course, so that prevented fish from moving around like they used to. The deforestation allowed for erosion and warming of the streams, um, acid factories. And then, to put it back on the department uh, and, the, and our you know, forefathers in the, in the commission, uh, indiscriminate stocking of all different species of fish. Essentially, if you had a fish that you liked from the old country and you wanted to bring it over and you had the f wherewithal to get it here, there was no problem with you stocking it here. And we ended up with you know, common carp and really uh, you know, some fish that we hold kind of highly in regard today, such as the brown trout, which came from Europe, and the rainbow trout, which came from uh, the western United States. They essentially took over a lot of the habitat that the brook trout once um, inhabited. And it was probably a combination of factors, but um, you know, the brown trout and rainbow trout have a little, probably less strict uh, environmental, you know, uh, you know, a little lower environmental standards, so to speak. I mean, they can live in a little warmer water, probably a little bit, uh, you know, they're tolerant of some dirtier water, possibly. And that, that's the type of conditions that were really out there at that time. But even today, with these, uh, in a brook trout stream, you have the invader coming up in there. So now, then we had a major shift in the habitat in the Esopus Creek, and I'm kind of jumping uh, really far forward to 
the, the 20th century where the Catskill system was built by New York City DEP. And the Esopus Creek was dammed and flooded. Um, and part of the grand plan was to also build Schoharie Reservoir and pipe that water down into um, Ashokan Reservoir. And I'm sure I could have come up with a better, more you know, uh, clear picture on this, but for now, just it shows the tunnel that connects Skahari Reservoir, which is far in the north here, uh, uh, north of Ulster County, down to the Esopus Creek. The Esopus Creek actually continues up here. I'm going to show you a picture in just a second. So that 18-mile tunnel uh, comes out right in the middle of the Esopus Creek um, in Alabin, and it's called the Shandaken Tunnel. And we, for decades, have called this the portal coming into the Esopus Creek. And it really changed the flow regime for the Esopus Creek entirely. You can see how little the Esopus Creek can be in the, uh, you know, in the summertime during low flow conditions. And, and this is the portal flow coming in directly 90 degrees into the stream. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's 10, 20 times what the upper Esopus might have in it. And with that augmented flow, especially during those low periods of time, it also, in, in the summertime, it provided increased uh, a bill, you know, decreased temperatures, which created the trout habitat all the way down to the Ashokan Reservoir for, in most years. It's interesting because uh, you know some of the tributaries um, were maybe more famous for their fishing than the Esopus Creek itself, Be and probably because the Esopus Creek would get dry from time to time or get really warm in its lower stretches. Um, but this really created some big fish habitat down in the in the Esopus below the portal. Um, and it, the, the fishing lore really started to build. Um, and, you, you know, with pictures like this, it wouldn't take long for people to uh, recognize they really wanted to, you know, come up to the Esopus and fish it. Um, it, it, uh, it also produced some, some amazing fish like this uh, state record brown trout back in 1924. I didn't mention, but Ashokan Reservoir was built in 1915. So here... Um, uh, nine years later, what you probably had was a fish that had lived part of its life down in Ashokan Reservoir. And that was a predicted thing, actually. The fish biologists at the time were recognizing that essentially it would be like a little inland sea, and you'd have the tributaries coming up, just like in the Finger Lakes or uh, you know, in the Great Lakes today. <clears throat> just another illustration of, of how popular the Esopus became. I, uh, Mac Francis, Austin Mac Francis has, a, has one of these for virtually all the uh, Catskill streams and all the little pools and riffles and runs are, are marked on here with names um, and it's uh, uh, you know just part of the whole fishing lure. I was getting at this before but uh, all these purple lines are the tributaries, the blue line is the, uh, the Esopus Creek and just as simple as this is, it, it just represents how, how much habitat there is out there um, for, for spawning. And if, if a brown trout or rainbow trout is living down here as, and getting really large, they can come up and, and really, to a great extent, there's very few impediments to fish movement in this drainage. Um, there's a, just a couple of dams, and there are some constrictions and some culverts and whatnot, but really, uh, you know, during good flow in the fall and the spring when these fish spawn, they can get up way up into these tributaries. And it pro provides for a lot of resilience in the population. Because if one watershed gets hit really hard by something, you know, one of, um, my, I'm one of these small little watersheds, maybe the other watershed might not have gotten hit so hard. So it spreads those eggs out into lots of baskets. And I mentioned it earlier, but the, the tributaries were well known on their, in their own regard. Uh, they were you know, excellent fisheries and, and probably where those stories about a thousand trout being taken in a couple days were coming from these tributaries more so than they would have been the Esopus. And they're beautiful spots. Um, just tons of little, dozens of places up in, the, in these tributaries. But the portal flows weren't really consistent initially. They were, some, they were all on sometimes and all off at other times. And uh, there was effort made, it, it's apparent from the correspondence in our files, that the city was trying to, you know, put up, put up on a good, you know, some good PR to the, to the local folks who uh, were, could see what was going on with the stream. Um, but, you know, 
when it really came down to it, they could and they would, when they needed water or didn't want water, they would turn it on and off. So, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't really until the mid-70s, I'm not sure about this 1977 date, I was going to look that up, I think it's 76 to 77, Part 670 regulations came into play, um, and that created regulations that the city had to abide by, that they were going to have consistent releases coming from the tunnel, from the portal, um, there were rules on maximum releases at times of the year, and also uh, up to four recreational high releases per year could be made. In 2006, some further regulation by our department with a speedies permit was put on New York City where temperature and turbidity came into play, and they're regulated on that. So that has helped out in a lot of ways, um, and it's created opportunities for rec reliable recreation through the summer, People can count on the flow being there for, for the most part. Um, it also created some new opportunities for new businesses that didn't even exist at the time. I mean, this is, a, this is the tubing industry <laughs> on the Esopus Creek and it's sort of peak summertime, on a peak summertime day. Uh, this is uh, right above Phoenicia from Woodland Valley down. So I'm gonna shift gears a little now and talk about the, Asho the Ashokan Reservoir fishery. I've been pretty much focused on the Esopus at this point. So the Ashokan Reservoir fishery, after it was created, I mean, there were already species of fish that were in the Esopus Creek. The rainbow trout, the brown trout were there. There were smallmouth bass down in the lower stretches. All those species had been stocked by individuals and by you know, state agencies. Um, the walleye may have been a native to the area. It's a little unclear about that, but they were also stocked in the area. And these were the four big predators in the Ashokan Reservoir. And that's what people would go there to fish for. Um, they were all sustained by the Emerald Shiner. The Emerald Shiner was the forage base, and they were very, very abundant. And they're actually a very good forage base, especially for rainbow trout, because they don't get really big. Um, a lot of forage fish gets a little bit too large for certain species of fish, and then it's outside their prey window, and they just really can't utilize that biomass. But the uh, Emerald Shiners don't get much bigger than that. So uh, it's perfect size for trout. Well, in the 70s, Alewife were introduced into the Ashokan Reservoir, and not by our department. That we believe it was they came in probably from from bait use, um, and they were are so proficient at feeding on little tiny zooplankton, uh, which is the same thing that emerald shiners feed on, and they just outcompeted uh, the emerald shiners to the point where emerald shiners are relegated to just sort of a remnant population in the lake. Um, the alewife. I mean, these aren't actual sizes <laughs> on the screen, but maybe relative to one another, they are. So you can, the, the alewife is a, is, a, is a big fish that, um, you know, a, a rainbow trout or, uh, you know, maybe, you know, or other, you know, fish eaters may not be able to take advantage of. It also really affected the alewife, I mean, the, the walleye. And, this is an, an example of how an invasive species really can affect the sustainability of a fishery uh, just outright. Um, walleye feed, um, I mean, I'm sorry, young walleye after they spawn, and in fact, in the, in the Ashokan system, they, the walleye will spawn, we're, we're spawning and still do to a degree in the Esopus Creek, in the chimney hole area, which is right where the reservoir and the creek attach to one another. And <clears throat> The eggs, after they hatch out, those larvae will float down into the main reservoir. And the alewives are looking for the biggest plankton that they can find out in the reservoir, and they're going to feed on that. They selectively look for the biggest zooplankton out there. Well, walleye larvae are zooplankton for a period of time in their life. It's called ichthyoplankton. And the alewives will just clean it right up, clean them right out. So what we had was a total failure in the walleye recruitment, uh, and the numbers just plummeted. The interesting thing is that the walleye um, f do grow very well eating alewives. And alewives are an excellent forage base for fish that can eat them because they're really high in, in fat content and they have a lot of calories. And so the fish can get really big if they can eat them. Uh, so we had a lot of really big uh, walleyes in the Shokan Reservoir. And just a few years ago when we were out there, uh, we caught a fish that was a bona fide over the you know, state record. Um, it was full of eggs, 
and those eggs would have been dropped probably by the time the season opened, so it was probably under the, the state record size by the time the season started. But you know, there are big fish out there. If we caught one, you know, there's, there could be others, that's for sure. Like, was that 17 pounds? It was 17 pounds, yeah. Um, I should have put a picture up here because that would have been an interesting one. But um, the, uh, So that's the story with the, with the walleye. I mean, they really have declined since then. Now we have a new fish, um, the white perch, that has shown up in Ashokan Reservoir. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of the relationship of all those and their numbers in just a minute. But we did some netting in, um, in Ashokan Reservoir to document their presence just in 2013. But we knew that they had been in Schoharie Reservoir in 20, 2002. Uh, interestingly enough, they had done a survey just the year before and didn't find any, and in 2002 they had them. So we, we can probably narrow it down to that period of time when they were, you know, really first coming on to around 2001, 2002. Um, and one possible explanation may be that those fish came through the tunnel and then down into the Esopus Creek and into Ashokan Reservoir that way. Um, because in 2013, that was the first year we were out there. We hadn't been gill netting in a while, but we got out there and did a survey in 2013. and um, found that uh, you know, most of the fish were three years or younger. And so, and so we could probably guess that they were uh, first in the reservoir sometime uh, you know, 2010 or a little before that. So what do, how do we make sense of all of this stuff? You know, as it's, you know, there's invasive species, there's floods, there's droughts, there's uh, different flow re regime changes. Well, we have a variety of tools that we can use. Um, and uh, I'm going to just talk really briefly, maybe for uh, eight minutes or so, on, on some recent results. But we can use creel surveys, which we interview anglers on the stream. We can count the anglers on the stream. We can get information about what their catch rates are. Is it, has it gotten better? Is it worse from in, throughout history? We can go out there with electrofishing gear and get a sample that way. Um, we can net our reservoirs with different types of nets. The general biological surveys are listed up here just because we ten, tend to use a co combination of techniques to try to, because each one of them have biases associated with them. So if we approach it with a lot of different techniques, then we can get a better sense as to what's going on. We've used uh, voluntary uh, uh, programs where anglers have written down all their fishing trips and we can track what, whether the fishery is getting better or worse over time. Um, aerial counts where we fly over some of the waters and count the number of anglers. It gives us a sense as to whether the pressure, fishing pressure has gone up or down. Um, is it too much? Is it, you know, for given the amount of fish that the people are taking away? Um, mark and recapture. We mark the fish and then we look for them as recaptures. That'll give us information about population size, about fish movement, about growth rates. Um, and then temperature monitoring is something we do because it's very important that the streams remain cold. And so we want to see, are they cold enough to support trout or not? And if not, why? Is there something that can be done within the watershed? That type of thing. Um, so back in, I'm, I'm jumping right up here to the recent time as, as far back as 2013. And at that point, we were getting complaints that the rainbow fishery had really declined in the Esopus Creek. Um, similarly, we were getting reports on the uh, reservoir fishery being down. And we also had some issues you know, in the re recent history from that point back, such as uh, Irene and hurricanes, droughts, that type of thing. Or were there other factors, such as white perch now being in Ashokan Reservoir? Um, so we did some electrofishing surveys. Um, and we had been, and, and Scott and USGS had been doing some electrofishing surveys um, to look at what um, was happening above the portal, below the portal. The, the above portal data is really pretty sound because we can get a really good sample. Below the portal, sometimes it's really difficult to work in that heavy, deeper, wider section of stream. Um, so I'm going to focus on, on what, we've, what we've seen in the above portal. And this the scale on the bottom, this goes back to 1988. And we have data that goes back even further, but 88 to 2013. And there were three sample dates back in 88 and then the 90s, where 60% of the rainbow trout were 60% uh, of the fish that we were catching were rainbow trout, anywhere from 70 to 50%. And that was the same thing going on in 2010. But you can see the next three years, 2011, 12, 13, the rainbow trout just seemed like they were disappearing from the, from the catch. So that was one alarming uh, 
thing other than just what the anglers were telling us. Ashokan Reservoir, we went out and did some netting there. We had data from 88 and 99. And um, of course, the rainbow trout and brown trout, as I explained, they're going to live to be you know, a few years older in, down in the reservoir and a lot bigger. Those fish then come up the creek and, uh, and spawn with a lot of eggs. So they could be the source of, or they are the source of a lot of the fish that are in the Esopus Creek. So maybe, maybe something could be happening out in the reservoir. Um, the brown trout, this is, uh, we can use a scale of, in this case, it's zero to three fish per net that we set overnight. And so in 88, it was right around two. In 99, it was right around two for brown trout. And uh, this is in the upper basin. And it had bumped up, actually, in 2013 for brown trout. Most of these were hatchery fish. Um, the lower basin, it did have a decline. But while we're talking a matter of scale here, because this is going to be important in just a minute, from two fish an hour down to like a one and a quarter, or up to maybe two and three quarters, something like that. Per night, not hour. Per night, yeah. It doesn't really relate very well to angling catch rates, um, you know, which could be, you know, on a per hour basis. <clears throat> so this was the rainbow trout numbers. This is the same scale on this side from zero to three. We're getting about one fish per net night um, at, in 88, 99, but it dropped down to, you know, like, I forget what the actual number is, but it's like less than 0 0.2, you 0 .13. know, 0 0.13, okay. So it, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's a big drop percentage-wise there. So it looks like, man, the rainbows are falling off in the, in the reservoir also. Um, now here's the white perch numbers. Is it, we didn't have any white perch here back then. Now we changed the scale rather from 0 to 3. This is 0 to 16. And you know, we had 5.5 per net night or, 14 and, or 15 per net night here. Um, so you can see that the numbers of white perch out there are, are, are probably getting to be pretty significant. White perch feed on some of the same things that rainbow trout feed on. So there's some concern there. Uh, not only uh, invertebrates, but small little fish. Um, and they can reproduce like crazy. And so that's why we're seeing some of those numbers, to the point where they sometimes eat themselves out of house and home. And they're, they're stunted. So they could be a pretty old fish, but they're just not growing anymore because they've eaten so much of the forage base. So this was a, a, you know, all of this was a big concern for us. So just to quickly summarize it, uh, three years of creel survey showed a decline in the rainbow trout percentage of catch uh, successively. Um, four years of electrofishing data showed the same thing. Same thing was happening in the reservoir. Um, and uh, yeah, same thing was happening in the reservoir. And we had this increase in the white perch. So I'm leaving it at that right now because our efforts has been to study this at, you know, and some of the ways that we're doing that, Scott's going to get into. Uh, we don't have all the answers, I'll tell you that. It's just the, you know, <laughs> but Scott will talk about it. Uh, and um, also the future. Right? Yes, yeah. definitely. Great. Great, well thanks, Mike. So I'm gonna pick up, leave you in suspense about these next three years for a moment here, just as we talk a tiny bit about the present day uh, Asopus fish community. So here we see the watershed. These green dots are the 18 study sites uh, where the USGS has been conducting fish surveys. Uh, so we have anywhere from two all the way up to eight years of continuous data at any one of these sites. And our data collection um, is similar to one of the methods that Mike described. Uh, we do backpack electrofishing surveys. Um, and that generates most of the data that I'll be presenting here today. So here, this is the, actually the upper Asopus near Oliveria. Um, so we set a blocking net at the bottom of the reach and then all the way up about 80, 100 meters up at the top of the reach. And we actually um, use a backpack electroshocker that's battery powered, anodes here, cathodes there. It creates an electric field about the size of a car. Um, it stuns the fish, um, so they're temporarily immobilized. They kind of roll on their side. These netters grab them. Um, and we do an entire pass up the creek, take all those fish, put them in a holding um, tank with aerators, um, go out and do a second pass, do the same thing, and a third pass. And, from the rate at which we're removing fish, we can do really tight population estimates. So if we get 100 brown trout in the first pass, 50 in the second, 25 in the third, we can run statistics to actually determine um, you know, a full population estimate for what was there. Um, so what conclusions um, have we seen, just at a general scale here, 
the Esopus fish community is very diverse compared to what we see um, in the adjacent basins. So the Neversink and the Rondout, for example, have much less diverse fish communities. Um, those streams tend to be colder, less productive, um, whereas in the Esopus, um, we see a low to high gradient of diversity from top to bottom. So if you go way up into the headwater streams of the Esopus, you're getting brook trout, uh, some slimy sculpin. As you work your way down, you start picking up more and more species. And eventually, um, when you get down towards Cold Brook, um, we actually may see as many as 15 fish species in a single survey, um, shortly uh, a short distance upstream of the reservoir. Um, so I wanted to take you through the, the major players, uh, the Esopus fish community today, because a lot of them you know, are the iconic trout species that we all know, but there's a lot of really interesting species, many of which are native, um, that you tend not to see so much. So one of my favorites here, this is the slimy sculpin. Uh, this is a native fish species. Uh, they are benthic, meaning they occupy the bottom habitats. They live in the small interstitial spaces in the substrate. And one unique thing about them, they actually don't have a swim bladder, which in short means that they sink. You put a brown trout in the Ashokan Reservoir, it can regulate how much air it has in its swim bladder and it can achieve neutral buoyancy anywhere in the watershed. These guys, they kind of motor up and then pff, they sink right back down. So if you ever actually observe them in the stream, they move around in a you know, very interesting pattern. Um, but in many of the upper reaches of the Esopus and the subwatersheds, um, they are the most abundant fish species. Uh, we have an incredible number of slimy sculpin and they just spend a lot of time under rocks and you just don't see them often. Um, occasionally they, uh, they get a little overzealous and try to eat each other. Most of the time um, they're actually insectivorous, but this was a, a, a gruesome uh, little sight that we found. Uh, I think this was actually uh, taken uh, from the west branch of the Neversink, but both were actually dead when we found them. The larger one probably suffocated trying to ingest the, the smaller one, but anyway, you just never know, I guess. Um, Long-nosed dace, uh, this is a native minnow species. Uh, as the uh, species name uh, cataracte indicates cataract or waterfall. They like fast moving water, so you're going to find them in runs and riffles primarily. Um, and they, again, they're a native uh, minnow for us. Um, Black nosed dace, um, the, I guess the little, little cousin, same genus, um, just a slightly smaller fish. And they like slower moving water, so you'll often see them um, in the you know, lower main stem, I guess, you know, occupying the near shore habitats. Uh, this one's cool. Um, I really like the cutlips minnow. Um, so, You'll notice these three cartilaginous lobes here on the lower jaw. Um, the, the middle of these lobes can actually be used to remove the eyes of other, Mike's laughing, he knows where I'm going with this, to, to remove the eyes of other fish species. And I remember as a kid, you know, back when it was legal to trap your own bait and, and use it before we were you know, educated and knew that that was a, a dangerous thing to do. I remember trapping minnows in the Adirondacks, putting them in a bucket, getting ready to go on a fishing trip with my dad, and then wondering why there were two shiners dead with no eyeballs left in the, in the bucket. And it's because you get a couple of these guys in here, and this is not a major foraging method for them. I think this is more of a stress response behavior you know, when they're in crowded conditions, but um, they are informally known as eye pickers, and they, they are a, a native uh, species, but you're really only going to find them in the lower parts of the upper Esopus, you know, downstream of the portal primarily. Uh, white suckers, most folks are familiar with them. They're a benthic species. They can get quite large. Um, they spawn in the very early spring. Um, they tend to run up the, out of the reservoir into the streams. And fall fish, I put this on with the anglers in mind um, because many of us have hooked into what we thought was a nice trout and it turned into a fall fish part way back as we were reeling it in. Um, they're a large native minnow species. Um, they can get upwards of 12 inches um, and frequently caught by anglers. Okay, getting into the trout. Um, brook trout, um, Mike covered it pretty well. State fish of New York, it's our only native trout um, to the Catskill streams. They're a very poor competitor, so if they have to compete with other fish species, they're going to struggle. Um, and they're a cold water obligate. Of all the fish we have in the watershed, they depend on cold water probably more so than any other fish. Um, four years in the stream is about it. They spawn in the fall, which is an interesting life history characteristic. So that means they're going to be laying eggs in October and November. Those eggs have to overwinter in the gravel and the fry won't emerge until the following spring. So if you get a big time winter flood, that's going to excavate the eggs out of the reds and really be bad for recruitment of brook trout, um, which obviously has climate um, implications as we go forward. Um, highly desirable to anglers and as Mike covered, um, you know, historically very significant fish uh, for the, um, you know, culture of the watershed really. So where are they now? Um, we know that they occupied essentially all major tributaries in the basin and part of the main stem until maybe you approached, I don't know, maybe where present day Big Indian is or somewhere in that, that area, the water started to get a little bit warm. And even before man came in and had our tanneries and deforestation and all that, um, the main stem um, was still a little bit too warm for brook trout um, as you went downstream. So where are they today? These are our same 18 study sites. And of course, 
Many of them are on the main stem, and the ones that are on tributaries tend to be fairly close to the confluences um, with the main stem. So this, this isn't meant to be quite as depressing as it's going to look, but of the, 18, <laughs> of the 18 sites that we've studied, the only one that consistently produces brook trout, and I'll say consistently, meaning maybe more than five fish per 100 meters of stream, is the Esopus here uh, at Oliveria. Now, that said, we've done enough, you know, I guess piecemeal surveys over the last 20 years in other parts of the watershed that we know as you go up Warner Creek, as you go up Birch Creek, uh, as you continue up the Esopus, brook trout have little strongholds in almost all these sub watersheds. So it's not to say that there are no brook trout, but they certainly have been marginalized to these small upper habitats, uh, much more so than they historically were. Um, brown trout, um, introduced I think 1889 or 1890, um, came over um, as eggs uh, on a boat from Europe. And if I remember correctly from Ed Van Putt's book, they had a hell of a time getting them over from Europe. The eggs kept arriving uh, from there, you know, I don't know how long did it take a ship, you know, a couple months to cross the Atlantic and the eggs were moldy three, four times in a row and they finally got viable eggs, I think on the third or fourth try. Uh, of course, they've been uh, very successful in the Esopus uh, ever since. Uh, DEC stocks a lot of brown trout, but the cool thing is brown trout reproduce very successfully. Um, the majority of the fish that we get in our surveys are either young of the year, about that long, or yearlings, you know, maybe about that long, and these are not stocked fish by the state. Um, so this means that in addition to the state stocking, there's a lot of reproduction that goes on. Um, and that's significant because if you go to a place like the Adirondacks, brown trout are stocked heavily and they really struggle to reproduce. So what we have here in the Catskills, um, you know, having a wild fishery here is, is pretty neat. Um, they are one of the top predators as far as fish go. Um, they can easily go six years um, in the stream, 24 inches, obviously bigger in the reservoir. Like brook trout, they spawn in the fall, so their eggs are also vulnerable to high winter flows. Now, rainbow trout, which is going to be a, a topic of, of interest here going forward. Um, another non-native trout species brought in um, from the West Coast in the late 1880s. Completely naturalized. Uh, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, but the state has not stocked rainbow trout since the 50s or, or 60s. Yeah. Um, so that means, you know, right, in, in, the, in the whole watershed though, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Um, so that means anglers that are catching rainbow trout, these are naturalized fish that were spawned, um, you know, in the river. And that's, that's a neat thing because, again, you look around New York State, there's not that many places um, that can support um, a wild rainbow trout fishery. Uh, four years is probably about it in the stream. 18 inches is a nice one. Obviously, bigger ones occasionally come from the reservoir. Unlike the other trout I mentioned, these guys are spring spawners. They're actually spawning now as we speak, and their fry will be emerging um, probably late May, early June. Um, highly desirable to anglers, great sport fish, obviously. So, Excuse me. Did yes. you say four years in the stream? Is that life expectancy? That, yes, correct. Yes, they're very, very, I mean, you know, give or take, obviously, right. but, but yes, they're a very short-lived uh, species, yes. Um, and actually, um, we have scale data that I'll show from the Ashokan Reservoir from about 500 fish. And granted, maybe the fish, as we're sampling them, of course, would have continued to get older if we didn't sample them. But we only have um, a handful of fish that exceeded age four. And I think we probably have, I don't know, 10 or 15 fish that actually reached age six. And that's even in the reservoir. Um, so, I mean, Mike, I'm not aware of a, a rainbow trout ever exceeding six, six years of age uh, you know, that we've actually had, had data on in, in this watershed. Um, so Mike covered the decline um, extremely well, so I'm going to breeze through this. Um, USGS had some data um, from nine sites um, consecutively that was showing a pretty good decline. Um, Mike showed you the gill netting data that showed about a 90% decrease in rainbow trout catch rate. Anglers were reporting both poor fishing and emaciated looking rainbow trout, um, which suggested that maybe we were seeing issues with the introductions of these invasive species. Uh, alewife and white perch could be out competing our rainbow trout. And of course, Mike covered the introduction of um, both of these invasives. And really important thing that I think a, a lot of folks uh, don't realize, rainbow trout in the reservoir um, or any kind of lentic habitat eat a lot of large zooplankton. Rainbow trout love daphnia. And these guys um, are incredibly prolific planktivores and can completely change plankton communities. So this potential for them to have negative competitive uh, interactions just by eating, uh, cropping out the large zooplankton is a very concerning possibility. So you might draw two hypotheses. Why would rainbow trout be uh, declining? Poor recruitment in the streams, maybe the habitat's been affected by recent flooding, um, or are we seeing issues with the reservoir? Mike mentioned that many of the rainbow trout that spawn and support this naturalized population 
are fish that live most of, their, um, most of the year in the reservoir and run up the tributaries to spawn. So if they're either starving or in poor condition on the reservoir because they're having to compete with these introduced species, it follows that they'd be less successful spawning, um, obviously, um, when they run up to the tributaries. So a two-fold study to try to get at this question. Um, we had electrofishing surveys at six sites where we were able to get a continuous period of record from 09 to 16. And we did aging and back calculation of length at age from approximately uh, 500 rainbow trout scale samples that uh, Region 3, uh, Mike's team had collected going back from 1952 um, to the present. And this is a series of length frequency distributions. So you have the length of fish here on the x-axis and you have the number of fish here on the y-axis. And this is 2009, obviously up to 2013, and in a moment I'm going to take away this pretty fish and show you what happens after this, but you've got to suffer for a minute here. So um, this is our young of the year in 2009. So these are fish probably less than 80 millimeters in July when we're out there sampling. And this is a great year class. We had really good recruitment this year. These are your yearlings, um, you know, moderate numbers there. 2010, great year class, really good number of yearlings. Um, we don't pick up a lot of older fish. Um, they're difficult um, for us to sample with electrofishing, so that doesn't mean a whole lot whether they're here or not. But as we get down to 2011, poor recruitment, poor year class, really bad year class in 2013, and very few yearlings. So we're kind of at rock bottom here, which is where Mike left the story off. And I'm happy to say that when this beautiful fish goes away, um, things are starting to tick up again. So 2014, not good, but better recruitment. 2015, pretty nice recruitment, and this past year, nice year class and decent number of yearlings as well. Now, this is only a seven-year data set, and this rainbow trout decline is potentially going back, you know, a few decades, so this is not saying that we're out of the woods by any means. This is saying that we're not seeing a linear decline. I mean, we're seeing ups and downs, and that's a heck of a lot better than some, you know, severe factor that's just, you know, uh, driving us out pretty quick here. Um, I want to shift gears now and talk about growth of rainbow trout. So these scale samples um, that the state collected both with their own sampling and through angler diary programs um, are an incredible resource. You can get a wealth of information off of scale samples. So like all hard parts of the fish, scales grow as the fish grows and generally proportional um, to the rate at which the fish is growing. So these are actually real data from the scale samples that the state collected. And you can see scale radius has a strong linear relationship with the length of the fish, which is great. That's the whole premise that allows us to use scales uh, to age fish. So here's a scale blown up under a microscope. Uh, we actually contracted the scale aging out to a lab that does this professionally because reading scales is, is not for the, the faint of heart. It's a, a pretty tricky uh, proposition here. Um, so this is a pretty old fish, and this is by, the, the lab sent me, I think, photos of every fish that they aged, and I picked this one on purpose because this is actually the easiest one of 500 uh, to be able to read. And it's, you know, it's comical because, of course, it's not, not easy at all. Um, so here you see this is the origin or the, the focus of the scale. And as the fish grows, it lays down these little lines called circuli, and at kind of at a set time interval. And when the fish is not growing well, the winter, essentially, when it's not foraging much and not growing, those circuli get stacked up on top of each other really tight and it forms what's called an annulus. And if you can count the annuli, you can figure out how old the fish is. So here's the first annuli, pretty tough to see. Second one is here. So this fish had its first birthday here, second birthday here. Between ages two and three, massive growth here, right? These are really spread out. So that, that tells us something that growth was obviously favorable um, in that particular year or for a fish of that size. And, so on and so forth, we can actually estimate the length of that fish at each of its subsequent ages. Uh, all fish have a birthday of January 1st, by the way, for these calculations. That's just the only, only way to do it consistently. But the question, of course, you're trying to answer is, are we seeing a decline in the growth following the introduction of one or both of these invasive species? So you have the growth increment here. In other words, what is the average amount of growth um, in a year for uh, rainbow trout? So the pre-alewife era, this is the good old days, you know, before the invasive species uh, that we're concerned about were in there. So if this is suggesting, well, if our hypothesis is, is correct that these invasive species are hurting trout growth in the reservoir, then the pre-alewife growth should be better than what we're seeing after the introduction. So what's probably most interesting um, is, you know, a lot of these fish, 
when, between zero and one, these fish were likely living in the Esopus or its tributaries, so I don't know that this is real interesting information here, but this group here is probably what's most interesting. So you have the post alewife period, that's approximately 1975, depending on which basin you were in, um, all the way up to uh, the post white perch period um, in the last few years. And what's striking actually is that we see increased growth in the post white perch period, um, at least among the one to two increment and the age two to three increment. Um, I don't think for a second that this means that white perch have had a beneficial effect on rainbow trout, um, but I do think that this data suggests the hypothesis that growth effects in the reservoir are the issue. Um, it can probably be thrown out the window. I mean, you might even be able to look at this and make an argument um, that growth has improved throughout this period. Um, but we certainly, I think, can reject the hypothesis that the introduction of these invasives has hurt growth. Not to say that there haven't been other negative effects, but this is just looking at growth. Growth right now um, looks pretty decent. And I wouldn't put a lot of stock into this. We hardly have any fish that get this old, and even this is not based on maybe as many fish as, as we would have liked. So same deal here. I'm just going to actually skip over this one because it's more trouble than I want to show. But it's a growth curve, and essentially, the white perch, the post white perch period is this line here, meaning that post white perch, the last 10 years, growth is actually better until about the four and a half year mark, and then growth actually becomes inferior. And this may be a real thing, this leveling off, or it may just be because if you look for these hollow points here, we hardly have any fish that get this old. So whether or not um, this leveling off is really representative or not, I wouldn't put a lot of stock into that at this point. So what can we take from this? Growth has not declined following the introductions, um, growth in the reservoir, of course, following the introductions of either invasive species. Um, our mean length at age, so the average length of a one, a two, a three-year-old fish, is very similar to what's reported in other populations in New York State, suggesting that our growth is pretty decent um, and not abnormally bad. So if competition with invasive species is likely not the cause of the declining population, or not the primary cause, this shifts focus back to issues of spawning or recruitment issues. And there's one really interesting topic that Mike and I have been collaborating on to, to try to delve into is this idea of thiamine deficiency. So thiamine is vitamin B1. It's an essential nutrient for all animals, and animals cannot synthesize it. They have to get it through diet. Alewife are really high in an enzyme called thiaminase, which breaks down thiamine in predators that consume them. So if you eat a whole lot of alewife, you're going to be thiamine deficient um, in theory, unless you have other food sources that are really high in thiamine. Um, this has been a huge issue in the Great Lakes, where they've had massive die-offs of steelhead, and they've observed terrible recruitment failures. So this is, this is a disturbing image you're about to see here. This is um, taken from SUNY Brockport, actually. Um, these are young of the year trout. Um, they're not actually dead, or not all of them. They're suffering from what's called early mortality syndrome, which means that they're highly deficient in thiamine. They kind of lie on their sides and wriggle around. Some of them will make it, most of them will die, and the ones that will make it, of course, you know, you're not going to be too adept at avoiding predators when this is the condition that you're in, so obviously they're highly vulnerable uh, to being consumed during this period. And what they found on the Great Lakes, uh, Salmon River in particular, when they have years when the rainbow trout are really thiamine deficient. It tends to go in annual cycles that are poorly understood. But approximately 90% of the eggs, when they are reared in the hatchery, um, will die However, once the fry try to emerge to the swim up stage and start feeding. If they bathe the eggs in a thiamine bath, they can get up to 70% survival of those same eggs. So this is scary because I just showed you those histograms of the different year classes we had in different years. But for all we know, Maybe that's 10% of what we should have had. We would never know if this was occurring. I mean, under the flows that we have in the spring, I mean, you're not gonna, you're not gonna see a, you know, a dead larval trout of that size. So we have no idea what role, if any, this is having. Um, so Mike and I collaborated. Uh, his team just collected 14 rainbow trout that we've sent off to uh, SUNY Brockport just for really preliminary thiamine analyses. Uh, the best way to do it is to actually extract eggs um, and try to rear the eggs the way I described and see if they respond to a thiamine bath and to see if you know, they have mortality. But this is kind of the million dollar question right now that we don't have a clue. This may have no bearing whatsoever. It may be such that the rainbow trout in the reservoir have a diverse enough diet, they're not eating enough alewife that this is a problem. Or this could be a devastating problem and we may just be on the tip of the iceberg here. Um, so just an interesting trendy topic and you know, hopefully at this time next year we'll be able to tell you something related to what we found. So I'm going to change gears here and talk a little bit about climate and, and fisheries, um, and what we may expect going forward. And 
we're actually doing okay on time, which is great. So two disclaimers here. Uh, I'm not a climatologist, I'm not a meteorologist, I'm not even a hydrologist. I like fish and I have to foray into other things occasionally to, to do my job. So what I'm gonna show you here are model projections. So they are exactly that. They're not gospel. Um, if they're anything like the way we predict the weather, they're probably not even that accurate, but they are something. And what I'm gonna show you is the synthesis of the 30 leading climate models all kind of averaged together into one. So they should be in the ballpark of what we might expect, but they are certainly not gospel as to what is going to happen. So the USGS actually built this neat tool um, called the Climate Change Viewer where we can take the 30 leading climate models and view them all together um, and kind of, I don't know, I hate to say dumb it down, but I needed it dumbed down for me, I can tell you that much, but to, to get it to a digestible level where we can actually answer, you know, tangible questions like what's going to happen in Ulster County 50 years from now, things like that. Um, so here's a shot of what it looks like. Um, you can do all sorts of neat stuff with it. You can look at the individual model outputs. I just tend to look at the averages because it's a little more digestible for me. You can look at two different emission scenarios. The RCP 8.5, where we assume our greenhouse gas emissions globally just keep on going up at the rate they're going. And the RCP 4.5, where we see emissions start to tail off at some point. Um, you can look at different geographic scales by watershed, by state, by county. You can look at all sorts of different response variables. So temperature, precipitation, uh, runoff, so on and so forth. The general predictions, and I will show you some details in a minute, but the general predictions are for Ulster County and the greater Catskills, warmer, wetter, but not consistently wetter at all months. We'll look at that in a second. And this is not from the climate change viewer, this is just from our USGS stream gauging network, greater peak flows. So not only higher magnitude flows, but more frequent high flows. So this is showing you change in maximum temperature. And this is challenging to digest these figures. I spent a lot of time trying to understand them. Um, this is the worst. All of these I'm going to show you are the bad emission scenario where emissions continue going up at a, at a pretty alarming rate. And they're all going to be comparing, we'll call this the recent past. So real data from 1981 to 2010 versus we'll call this the predicted future uh, 2050 to 2074. So it's saying what is the average change between the recent past and what we can expect from 2050 to 2074. Uh, and this is the change in maximum temperature. So this is calculated if you took every single day in a year and said what was the maximum temperature every single day and average that, that's how this is calculated. So long story short, the average maximum temperature is projected to increase by 6.1 degrees Fahrenheit um, between the recent past and this future of 2050 to 2074. Again, this is under the worst emission scenarios. This is kind of the worst case scenario, if you will. Um, the individual model estimates, all 30 of them predict an increase that ranges from 2.9 to 8.8, .8, depending on which model you look at. And what's interesting to me is, I wanted to know, is it going to be consistent in every single month, or is it going to vary? And um, the blue is the recent past, the red is what's predicted, and you can see the summer months do tick up a little disproportionately more um, than the other months. But in general, it's a pretty steady increase across all months, which is not what we're going to see for precipitation uh, momentarily. So this is the exact same figure, but now it's change in minimum temperature. And it's showing us essentially the same thing, that between the recent past and this 2050 to 2074, the mean of that future period, we're projecting to see an average increase of about 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit in um, this minimum temperature. Now, here, instead of showing you the same pattern of graphs, I'm showing you the two different emission scenarios. And this is what the temperature, of course, the minimum temperature would do under the bad emission scenario. And here's the one where we curtail our emissions. So both of them show temperature going up, but obviously on a vastly different scale. Precipitation. Um, this to me is arguably the most interesting one. Same situation, so bad emission scenario and recent past compared to this 2050 to 2074 we see an increase in precipitation, an average of about 0.4 inches a month, which doesn't sound like much, but if you consider that over the course of a year, that's approximately 10 inches, and we get, what, 50, 60 inches a year in the Catskills. Um, so you add that on, that's another 20% or so rainfall, so it is significant, I guess, in the annual context. Um, all individual models show an increase in annual precipitation, but the interesting question is when, and this has major implications for um, fish spawning, for flooding. Um, you can see for the summer, June, July, August, and really into September into October, we don't see a major increase. It's the cold weather months where the precipitation is projected to increase, and that's November, December, January, February, um, March, April, even into May. So 
this is interesting, and this will have implications both for flooding and for droughts, potentially. So the snowfall one, I'm probably getting too far into the weeds here, but this was uh, an interesting looking figure, so I thought it would be fun to talk about for 30 seconds here, and, and really uh, a striking one as well. So this is in February alone. I just wanted to look at February. Um, and the snowfall's in water equivalent, right? It's really hard to say how much snow, because is it light and fluffy snow? Is it dense, wet snow? So if we do liquid equivalent, we eliminate that problem. This says in February, we're projected to see a 1.1 inch uh, decrease in snowfall between the recent past and that period in the future. And 1.1 inches, that's approximately 10 to 12 inches, um, you know, depending on how fluffy your snow is. All models show a decrease in February snowfall. Um, and actually, the really striking stuff is in the snow belt actually up here in the, in the Adirondacks where they're you know, projected to lose maybe four times as much snow as, as we are here in the Catskills. So does a few degrees matter? So we're, we're starting to get back to fish, something I'm more, more comfortable talking about here. And this is actual real data that we collected from the upper Schoharie Creek um, as part of a thermal imaging project in 2011 and 2012. So Schoharie 7, this is at Elka Park uh, on the upper Schoharie. Schoharie 1, this is at Prattsville, um, right in the village by the USGS gauge. We had temperature loggers in the stream for about two years. And this is the water temperature that we observed. So this upper thermal tolerance limit, this is the, the one day survival threshold for brown trout. This is 25.3 degrees determined by laboratory and field studies. Um, in other words, if brown trout are exposed to above this temperature for a day or more continuously, they're expected to die based on previous research. So you can see right now, Elka Park, over two summers, you know, we had a brief exceedance here, but for the most part, this was reasonable trout habitat as far as the temperature goes. Prattsville um, was already, of course, not, not a surprise to folks that know the area, was already getting pretty toasty. Um, and you know, this would be like total mortality. I mean, you're talking a couple months of exceeding or flirting with the threshold. Now, Stream temperatures, of course, are not going to tick up at the same rate that air temperature is, right? Stream temperature is driven by groundwater inputs, by riparian shading. There's a lot of factors. So stream temperatures will certainly not increase at the same magnitude that air temperature will. But they are likely to increase to some extent. And if they go up one or two degrees Celsius, Prattsville, of course, already being, you know, not very good trout habitat to begin with during the summer. Even places like Elka Park, I mean, if this ticks up a little bit, all of a sudden you're going to be awfully close or maybe even exceeding that upper um, thermal tolerance limit. Um, also, this is the optimal growth range for brown trout. Um, that was the focus of this study. And you can see if we tick up a little bit, we'll spend even less time in the optimal growth range. So this is the depressing slide. The next one's a little more uplifting. Um, the increased precipitation that's projected could mean increased groundwater inputs um, and uh, thermal refuge becoming even more of an important factor in sustaining uh, our local trout communities. So groundwater temperature generally um, tracks the annual air temperature, so approximately 50, low 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we have increased or continued strong groundwater inputs in the face of a, a warming climate, this could really help mitigate some of the adverse effects on our fisheries. This is actually a shot of aerial thermal infrared imagery we collected on the upper Schoharie Creek. Um, the west kill comes in down here. The creek's flowing to the north. This is 23A, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and this is showing you the surface temperatures of the water on a day in July or August um, in 2011 when we, when we flew this. And here we see a neat little pocket um, of thermal refuge that was about um, I don't know, we'll say one and a half degrees uh, Celsius, uh, so a little over two degrees Fahrenheit colder than the rest of the stream. Now, these type of areas are incredibly important, and out west there's been a lot of research on these thermal refugia, and they can sustain great trout populations in streams where maybe, excuse me, um, approximately 90 plus percent of the stream habitat is unsuitable to trout in the summer. But if you get a handful of really good thermal refuge areas, either where there's a cold water tributary coming in or you have a nice groundwater uh, seep coming in, these areas can sustain huge numbers of trout for these really stressful periods um, during the summer. And to the point that even in the Northeast, there are other states that will close some of these thermal refugia um, to angling. Um, do we have one on the beaver kill, actually, where they close a, a thermal ref? We do, yeah. So even in New York State, we have a thermal refuge that's actually closed to angling because you know, I've seen photos where these refugia are just black with trout. I mean, trout are able to find this, these areas very successfully. So 
I guess the take home here is the increased precipitation could mean that our groundwater inputs remain very strong, maybe even become stronger, um, and this could help mitigate some of the, yes? But if the, but if the temperature goes up six degrees, then the average temperature is going to go up too. The groundwater temperature. The groundwater is not going to be as cold. Anymore. It won't be as cold, but potentially, you're, you're, you're right. Um, but it still will be you know, a heck of a lot better than uh, you know, the ambient stream water yeah, temperature. Yeah. Yep. Um, no, these are generally going to be uh, direct um, inputs of water, whether it be you know, a groundwater seep or a spring or a small cold water tributary that's incredibly uh, shaded. And finding these things is kind of the, the critical part. And thermal imaging works OK. The issue is that cold water is denser than warm water. So if you're just imaging the surface and the water is not well mixed, you may miss some of these refuge areas. Um, of course, the solution is to do the imaging in the winter when then the groundwater is warmer than the ambient stream water, um, but that has its own associated problems as well with ice coverage and whatnot. Um, you can also use a topographic wetness index, which is a, a elaborate GIS process that actually predicts where the groundwater inputs are going to be. But from a conservation point of view, finding and protecting these areas to make sure that we don't inadvertently disturb them um, with you know, restoration projects or highway work or whatever the case may be um, is extremely important for conservation. All right, extreme events. I'm coming down the home stretch here. Um, obviously, uh, any talk about climate um, is probably needs to include some consideration of these extreme events and how they're going to affect our communities. Um, annual peak flows are generally increasing. Um, this is kind of the classic one in the hydrology world that we've been showing recently, that, uh, you know, because it shows a really strong increase. Not all USGS gauges are behaving quite the same way. Beaver kill at Cooks Falls. Going back, believe it or not, this gauge has been active since about 1916, so about a 100-year period of record. Each of these dots is showing you the highest recorded flow at that gauge in a given year. So obviously, the prevalence of high flows is much greater the last 20 years relative to what it was previously. So high flows are becoming more common and of greater magnitude, certainly in some systems more than others, but most of the projections anticipate this trend to continue. Um, interestingly, We've studied floods quite a bit, um, Irene being the most notable one in this watershed, and their effects on aquatic biota aren't always as severe as we would expect. Um, we found that communities are extremely resilient, not resistant. Resistant means that the flood doesn't even impact them. Resilient means they get hammered, but they come back quickly, and that's what our observation has been. Uh, we worked with the New York State DEC Stream Biomonitoring Unit to look at invertebrates before and after Irene, and the density, the sheer numbers of insects in the stream was reduced by over 90% after Irene. I mean, almost totally gone. Within three to six months, the invertebrates were showing strong recovery. Within 12 months, we actually had a higher density of invertebrates in the stream than we did before Irene, which is really hard to figure. Um, fish, we were out 10 months after Irene, and fish, communities, fish numbers were actually greater than they were two months or one month before Irene. Now, that's a little deceiving because the fish community was in rough shape before Irene because we'd had a bad drought late 2010. So that's not to say that Irene was good, but it obviously didn't continue the decline of the fish community. Um, drought is kind of the, the silent killer that doesn't get talked about as much, which I'm actually more concerned about from a fisheries perspective. Um, it's a little unclear what the trend is in drought. It seems pretty obvious that floods are increasing. Um, the prevalence of drought is not quite as obvious what's going on. Um, a number of papers recently have suggested drought is going to occur more frequently. It does follow that we're going to have warmer summers. We're going to have about the same amount of summer precipitation. You combine those two things, it only seems reasonable that drought could become a greater factor. Um, whatever the case, um, we found drought to be, in our limited data set, to be pretty damaging um, to our aquatic communities. This is the 2010 drought seen at the Esopus Creek at the USGS gauge in Alabin. Um, discharge in cubic feet per second here on the y-axis. Time in 2010 here is on the x-axis. The blue line, of course, is just your discharge. Orange dots are the, the median daily statistics. So 52 years of stream gauging says that on August 13th, that's what the flow should be over you know, 52 years. So here we can see in 2010, for most of the summer, 
we were below where we should be. Obviously, we kicked up a little bit in August, fell right back down. We got to about seven CFS at Alabin, uh, right above the portal, which is a, a trickle. Um, and then, of course, we had a massive flood, uh, I think October 1st of 2010, and that really rehydrated the, the system. But this drought was sufficient to really crush fish communities, or at least that was our interpretation. The data we collected in 2011 before Irene was really depressed, and the most obvious explanation was that I mean, it makes sense, right? Your stream habitat contracts substantially when this happens, so the quantity of the habitat contracts and the quality. It's warmer and has less dissolved oxygen, so drought really hits you every way possible. This is 2016, comparing the same period at the same gauge. Initially, things are similar. We actually kick up a little bit um, in August, but where it differs substantially is we don't get relief in October. Things actually get worse. And this is the critical spawning period for brown trout and brook trout, especially for brown trout. They're ascending the Ashokan Reservoir, many of them um, looking for places to spawn. And it was considered such a severe problem, the DEC actually closed a large part of the Esopus to angling because it was felt that these brown trout were so vulnerable um, and under such stress just trying to navigate the low and warm conditions. So we don't know. This is total speculation. But based on the 2010 experience, um, we're expecting to see uh, a really, really poor year class of brown trout in 2011 following this drought. But like all things with biology, there is a silver lining. We've seen a pretty strong relation, negative relationship between brown trout year class strength and rainbow trout year class strength. The brown trout fry emerge earlier because they're fall spawners. They tend to outcompete the rainbow trout fry, all else equal. So if the brown trout fry, um, if the eggs got, um, or well, if the spawning was just not successful this fall, um, rainbow trout may actually have a banner year in the absence of competition from young of the year browns. Total speculation. Um, we'll be back out in 17 and 18 uh, to try to confirm this. So I guess some summary thoughts on how our fisheries might be affected going forward. Um, we expect brown trout, well they already are actually, we've seen this in places in the Never Sink, um, to encroach further upstream into the brook trout strongholds. Um, we've found them working their way upstream um, on the Never Sink, and a number of papers from around the United States uh, have shown that this phenomenon is occurring. Non-native and warm water fish species, such as smallmouth bass, may start working their way up the main stem a little further. Um, this is an interesting one. Portal waters may become increasingly important for sustaining the main stem. Um, this, I should have an asterisk there. This assumes that they can be managed such that the portal releases are cold throughout the warmest part of the summer, which of course has not been achieved um, in, you know, consistently in recent years. If the hypolimnion on the Schoharie Reservoir, the cold deep water, can be managed such that when we need it most in July and August that we get those cold water releases, um, I shouldn't say releases, just, you know, just consistent cold water flow, um, this will really help mitigate um, any kind of warming pattern. So, of course, this can't help you once you get upstream of the portal, but for that main stem um, section downstream of the portal, portal waters, if they're managed well, um, are going to be a huge ally towards sustaining that as viable trout water. Um, and finally, forest pests. Um, you could have had a whole talk on that. I certainly wouldn't be the person giving it, but um, forest pests are likely to affect um, our canopy. Hemlock woolly adelgid, of course, being potentially the most dangerous as far as uh, fish and stream temperatures go, but emerald ash borer, uh, Asian longhorn beetle, you could probably name six or eight others. Um, so they're going to potentially affect our riparian canopy um, and affect nutrient cycling as well in ways that you know, maybe we can't even fully anticipate. And with that, I'm going to hand back off to Mike, and he'll, he'll take us down the home stretch here. Just a quick question. Yes. Is thiamine deficiency affecting the brown trout? Great question. Um, I mean, it, it has been shown to affect lake trout. I mean, on the Great Lakes, lake trout basically don't spawn successfully. Same thing with Lake Champlain, um, because it's believed that they're so thiamine deficient, they have the same problem that I've, I've shown. Um, so. Could it be affecting our brown trout here? Very possibly. Um, since brown trout appear to spawn quite successfully and because the state stocks them heavily, I guess it's slightly less of a priority. Um, but I mean, in theory, all the same reasons that it affects rainbow trout, it could and should be affecting brown trout as well. So yeah, very fair question. And just to follow up on that, it's interesting because Chinook out in the Great Lakes almost feed exclusively on alewife, whereas steelhead do have a little more variety in their diet yet the Chinook are really never affected by thiamine problems. And it's believed that the different species actually have different sort of requirements uh, than, you know, so rainbows and brown trout could be quite different, even though they, uh, 
you know, they may be eating the same forage, and in some cases the brown trout may be eating more alewives than the rainbows, but right. it could well, that, affect them differently. That's a great point because, I mean, I'm not aware of any literature that's actually shown recruitment failures um, to brown trout. So brown trout may actually have a, a greater tolerance to low thiamine levels. I mean, that's just pure speculation, but Mike, Mike may be right. That may be part of it. And it's funny because uh, Atlantic salmon are, were the classic case where this was first discovered, and Atlantic salmon are probably closer to brown trout than right. anything else. So uh, certainly more than rainbows. Uh, the last bit here, I just uh, want to finish off with um, talking about where some of the ongoing studies we have going on. Uh, and it's only going to be five or six minutes, and then we'll have lots of time for questions, I believe. But just some of the tools that we use um, and that we're currently con continue to use we're focused a lot on habitat. We have all sorts of regulations and rules that protect stream beds and banks. We regulate discharges and water withdrawals. We're trying to do what we can, and certainly through groups like the Shokin Watershed Stream Management Program, working with uh, you know, best management practices within the watershed with stormwater runoff, which causes increased flushes of warm water coming into streams and s silt and turbidity sometimes. Uh, want to see barriers removed if at all possible, but I do have to say in this case with the removing barriers, there, there could be a place in time when a barrier actually may be a good thing when you're talking about brook trout because as we were talking, the rainbows and brown trout, if they can't get up to a spot where we have just brook trout, that barrier may be worth maintaining in some instances. So, um, but for the most part, we want to see barriers removed and open things up for spawning fish. Um, and reconnecting the floodplain I think has been pretty clear how important that can be, where you need the river to be able to spread out so that it can you know, cause less damage during big flood events, when if you constrict it through berms or other infrastructure that's narrowing your stream, it's just going to create this high, high velocity that'll just rip things up downstream. Uh, and we, all, we still have in our toolbox you know, the ability to stock fish. We have fishing regulations we can always impose if, they're, if things get bad. And one thing we're always working on in our office, and it's sort of unrelated to everything else, but fishing access is something that we're always focused on. Um, so in the future, what we're going to be working on, sort of going back to that last slide, all this stuff, we're going to continue our stocking. We're going to continue habitat protection, improving access. But the, as the work that, that uh, Scott has just gone through just is, is a great example of why we really need to have kind of annual sampling so that we can see how one flood or one drought affects things. If that could be recreated over time, if we have 15 years worth of data rather than seven or eight, um, if every time there's a flood in the fall or a drought in the fall, you have the same sort of impact, you know, results, that's going to start to really make things clear on how the system should, you know, is functioning. Um, and so that, that sampling is going to continue this year. That's funded through the Ashokan Watershed Stream Management Program. Um, Ashokan Reservoir sampling, our department, uh, our, our unit is going to be boat electrofishing the reservoir because we're still trying to assess what the impacts of the white perch are and if that population is still on the rise or if it's leveling off or what it's doing. Um, Rainbow trout aging, we still have more, more work that Scott was mentioning. Uh, we're going to verify some of the aging that we've done. You saw how difficult some of those scales may be to age. Another bony part in the fish is uh, ear bone, and you generally see much more consistent patterns of growth. They're easier to read. It's just a lot harder to get those. But since we are, we are sacrificing some rainbow trout to do the thiamine uh, study, we took the otoliths from those fish to compare to our scale samples to see that verification. Um, so that's going to happen this year, and that, that's a, a cooperative agreement with a number. I think USGS is putting money in for that one uh, on your own. Uh, cooperative effort is ongoing between our department and New York City DEP. We want to try to get these reservoir releases so that they're both good for New York City and good for the environment and good for you know, everybody involved. So, uh, this year we have plans to really start monitoring things a little earlier. The, regu the, the rules that are in place for the speedies permit really don't require the city to start at, you know, accounting for the cold water until middle of June to early part of July. And that's a little too late, quite honestly. So we're gonna, they've agreed to start looking at that in earlier in May going forward this year. And we'll see how that goes. Um, 
There's a study that Ashokan Watershed Stream Management Program just funded where over 100 individual sites within the upper Esopus watershed are going to be monitored uh, with temperature probes. That um, example that Scott had for the thermal imaging, which is a different technique entirely, but it illustrated how important those little thermal refuges are. With 100 sites in the watershed, you know, maybe we'll find some of those and uh, focus on where some of the uh, you know, groundwater inputs are coming. Uh, that could be very helpful, I believe, for the future. We also have an ongoing, uh, this is the second year of a two-year study that we're doing in Region 3. It, it, it um, mimics studies that have been done in other parts of our state already, where we're going out looking for the presence and absence of brook trout throughout the whole region. And uh, I think we did 500 different surveys last year, close to it, different individual sites throughout the region. We really haven't done a lot of the cat skills yet because we already know that there's brook trout present in those areas, so we focused our attention in areas that we were kind of unknowns to us. But um, I think we're going we're gonna to be working through those areas this year because we were able to get enough done in the rest of this uh, part of our region last year. Um, and uh, that'll be very interesting information because, as Scott was mentioning with his graph, a lot of their sites are down low in the watershed. Most of those streams we know there are brook trout up in the upper parts. Um, and if we can, you know, figure out that distribution a little bit better, it may be really interesting to track going forward with, with any sort of climate change that occurs. And changes within the watershed is, you know, with the uh, woolly adelgid and the potential for defo uh, defoliation of the, some of the trees and opening of the canopy, that could raise the water temperatures in some of these streams too. So it would be good to have sort of some base data that we can go by from that. Um, and... That's all I think we have, and we're here for questions for the next 10 minutes and into the break, if you'd like. What's been the effect of the flooding uh, spawning habitat in the Asopus and the tributaries? As I know, it's you know, up there above the border of the East Coast, it's going to Yeah, by Irene. Right. Change the complete uh, substrate of the stream. Right. I see one spot up there in an area I fish looks like it's been turned into great spawning habitat. Yes. I never see the red in there. Right. Do you go out and, and do red counts in the spring of the fall? We really haven't done that, um, just quite honestly. But I think what you observed is often what you'll see. I mean, the initial turbid flush looks really, really bad. You have a lot of fine sediments that go through. Um, but it does actually scour out some of those also, and there's sort of some net gains and some net losses in er certain areas. And it just dis redistributes maybe where the spawning may take place and where it's going to be most effective. But, um, you know, as long as it didn't open up some new clay vein or some new, you know, create some sort of landslide that's going to continually bleed off sediment for a long period of time, then I kind of feel like there may be, a, you know, no net loss. It's more of a problem with opening up the canopy in these, that, and creating warmer temperatures in some of the little watersheds, I think, are... Yeah, can I steal the quicker? Yeah, sure. yeah we, uh, and similar to what Mike said, we don't have you know, actual data on exactly you know, where the brown trout are spawning and you know, red counts, but one interesting thing that, I don't know how far I have to go to, to find it, but it's, it's worth, worth finding. I planned to originally talk a whole section about the Irene responses, and I just didn't feel that uh, I had time to to do it all justice, but um, one thing that's, um, okay, yeah, here's, here's the one I wanted. So this is brown trout uh, histograms. So keep in mind, 2011, this is before Irene. This is about a month before Irene this data was collected. So similar to rainbow trout, terrible year class, virtually no yearlings, not many older fish. Look what happens, this is, these fish were spawned a month or two after Irene, right? Because the browns are spawning in October and November, the eggs over winter in the gravel, we're picking them up in July the following year. So. I don't know where they spawned. I don't, you know, I can't say for sure it was an Irene response, but this is the best year class um, in what the seven, eight years of data that we have. So I think it's entirely possible that some areas the fine sediments were cleansed and spawning habitat was actually improved. I have a question. Going back to the uh, alewives, they're a uh, heron, right? Yeah. yeah. And anadromous? Yes. So originally, uh, they're one of the ones that spawned in Black Creek, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what was their history in the, in the uh, Isopus? In the lower Isopus, they could only get, I don't know when they built the dam in Saudi Arabia. Right. It was in the 1800s, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't come above the dam. Yes. Uh, but at some point, they could have gone, I don't know how far the Isopus.
Yeah, I mean, a lot of the tributaries to the Hudson that don't have really great, you know, big barriers, Black Creek is an excellent example. They really don't go up that far. You know, they, the, the higher um, velocity flows, they, you know, does seem to limit some of their movement. So, you know, they don't, they don't go up that far. I don't think that they would have gone up. You know, there was a natural barrier in Saugerties to begin with. I think that dam has been built on top of a, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess one irony is, I mean, we're, we're concerned about both the alewife and the blueback herring migrations on the, on the Hudson River. You know, those stocks at like the ocean scale are, are declining, yet, yeah. you know, we get them in our inland waters, they, they wreak havoc on us. So it's just one of the many ironies of the management, I guess. I know they were brought into the office, uh, into the by big for and we have an interesting correspondence in our files in the early 70s about how you know the Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs wanted us to stock alewives in the Shokin Reservoir, and we had you know we had sort of responses back saying that no, we weren't going to do something like that. Well, you know. A matter of a couple years later, they showed up. So, yeah. The impact of the low temperature of the portal discharges is pretty, I think, unarguably beneficial for the fishery. How about the turbidity? Yeah, that's a comment about that. I mean, other than being creepy and efficient when it's at color. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we when we were working on that speedies permit and trying to put together some sort of uh, standards for the turbidity in that permit. Um, it was uh, it was really difficult because our standard is no visual contrast. So if there's a visual contrast, then that's a violation. Um, yet in this case, we were not looking at that standard because uh, it, it, that would have been unattainable, and it really wasn't going to. I think really get at the at the issue. That's more that standard was put in place more for from a standpoint of a disturbance of the better banks and creating some turbid, you know, from a work condition. So we looked at um, the suspended sediment size, which is a clay particle, and we looked at what the literature told us was the impact from you know certain concentrations of that you know particle at, at different time for different periods. So a dosage based on a period of time for a rate and what the impacts to different life stages of fish were. And so we tried to use as much of that type of science to come up with um, some boundaries to then relate to the way that you measure turbidity, which is not suspended sediments, it's a refraction of light thing. So we, we really uh, just were kind of out there. It, there's no real comparable standard on any other permit that I'm aware of that the state has. So we were forging, you know, uh, forging ahead in new ground. And um, so the basic point is that you know, when you have turbidities over 100 NTUs, uh, it's a relatively short period of time that you may have a, a, an impact to a larval or an egg, maybe. But if you have 20 NTUs in Eusopus Creek with this particle size, it can actually go for quite a while before you're going to have a real sublethal or lethal impact. And so we, we tried to use that to make the boundaries. The city is supposed to shut the portal down if it gets over 100 NTU. Uh, and we have to weigh and balance what that's going to mean when we have a need for cold water in the middle of the summer. And so that's why sometimes we've had to you know, just grit and bear the fact that the turbidity is bad, but it's going to be worse if we have, like Scott was showing, with those sublethal or those lethal temperatures. And so we get between a rock and a hard place sometimes, and, and we have to just make a decision as to what the best best hand we can make with the, that that. But in the late '70s, Chuck Schwartz, as you know, actually documented you find it in all copies of the Freeman fish kills from the turbidity coming out of the portal that he actually did the monitoring for us uh, of turbidity coming out of the portals before 2000, which was the basis for our lawsuit against New York City to establish a speedy permit process to at least regulate flows and turbidity and capture so that it's a legal basis for us to compare. 
Well, we do actually, uh, Mike, you might remember the years better than I do, but we did have a study around the time that I came in and started working for the USGS that was collaborative with USGS, Cornell, and I imagine you guys were involved as well with TJ Ross uh, and the trout telemetry study, and they monitored trout growth um, in fish with transmitters uh, both above and below uh, the portal, and they actually found that during the summer, brown trout uh, lost weight in both areas, meaning that we're already thermally stressed both above and below the portal, but the weight loss was actually less below the portal, suggesting that the cold water from the portal apparently, you know, slightly reduced stress. They had other stress indicators too, you know, hormones and other uh, blood plasma uh, things they looked at, but they found that downstream of the portal, despite the turbidity, um, the temperature benefits slightly mitigated the temperature issues, but brown trout in all areas were losing weight, which was an interesting finding that they were unhappy in all places. Why is there so much turbidity up in this area? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, going back to when they built the reservoirs, they recognized the fact that there was a lot of potential for turbidity both within the Esopus drainage and in the Schoharie drainage to the point where they built the uh, Ashokan Reservoir with the dividing weir, and the idea was that it could, you know, use that as a settling basin in the upper basin. So there's some natural amount of turbidity that's just in there. There, are, there were old lake beds that existed geologically that on the bottom of those lake beds was essentially a clay deposit. So there's layers of clay, and as the you know, rivers have cut back down through those layers of clay, it immobilizes that, that clay sediment. So, uh, DEP actually and the stream, Ashokan Watershed Stream Management Program have some pretty promising huge projects on the Stony Clove that seem to have made a difference. Uh, in trying to mitigate some of those clay lenses that have been open for decades. Uh, and they're studying the turbidity above and below, and it's going to be interesting to see how much of an impact it's going to have. Visually, it looks a lot better. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're excited, I mean, the guys in our office, but they also are really clear to point out that, you know, we haven't really been tested with, with serious uh, high, high flows yet uh, either, so they're, they're very cautious about the results, but they, they share your optimism.